first Peter. <gasps> you ever have a project at work that you spend several days working on, you get it finished, and then the boss tells you, I need you to do another project for tomorrow instead? That's this morning. <laughs> Take your Bibles, I guess if we're going to start somewhere, we'll start in the book of John, chapter 12, but I guarantee we will not stay there long. So hopefully your fingers are ready to flip through the pages or your phone battery has a full charge as we scroll through different texts this morning. John chapter 12. This morning as we look at timeless truths from the Passover. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. John writes, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered what these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. We see Jesus, you know, typically this is Palm Sunday, where Christ is entering Jerusalem the week before his death, burial, and resurrection. But why was Jesus coming? He was coming, the text tells us, for a feast. There were already great multitudes there for a feast, specifically the feast of the Passover. And this morning, as we enter this Passion Week of the Christ, I would like for us to consider three timeless truths from the Passover. You know, if we want to learn about the Passover, where do we look? Exodus. That's where most of us would go. Where in Exodus? Nine, ten, twelve. That's where most people would go. And most people might be correct. But we find the Exodus actually predicted hundreds of years before. The first truth from the Passover that I'd like for us to consider this morning is the fact that God keeps his word. And because God keeps his word, we can trust him. If we go to Genesis chapter 15, God says to Abram, okay, this is before Abraham is called. Before his name is changed, before he's given, really the promise that I'm going to use you to make my people. Before any of that, God says to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and your descendants will serve them, and they, the strangers, will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. We see almost 600 years before the Exodus event happens, God makes the promise to Abraham that there is going to be a time of 400 years where your descendants are going to be afflicted in a foreign nation in a foreign country. But after those 400 years are up, God has promised, I am going to take them out. I am going to deliver them. 
skip forward a couple of generations. In Genesis 46, God repeats this promise to Jacob. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. God repeats this promise to Jacob several generations later. Even though that they would be slaves in this land... It gave them a protected environment for a young nation that goes down into Egypt with 73 people. A small family by those standards. But a nation that would 400 years later come out in the millions. Even though they were enslaved, God promised that he would bring them out and this was an area for this young nation to grow and to thrive. In Genesis chapter 50, maybe, there we go. Joseph, near the end of his life, remembers the promise that God gave to his father Jacob, remembers the promise that God gave to his great-grandfather Abraham. And Joseph tells his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and he will bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel. He made them promise him something. When you leave, because God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So when you leave, take my bones with you. Bury me in the land promised to my fathers which is exactly what happens. In Exodus chapter 1, we're getting closer to the actual Exodus account now. Starting in verse 7, the children of Israel, they were fruitful. They increased abundantly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, one who did not know Joseph, and he sees all of these strangers, all of these Israelites in the land, and he says to his people, look at the children of Israel. They are more and they are mightier than we are. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and it happens that in the event of war, they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore... They set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built, the Israelites built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more the Egyptians afflicted the Israelites, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread, the Egyptians were in fear of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. You know, men will change. Memories will fade. History may even be rewritten. We have this new pharaoh, who had no idea the story of Joseph. The story of the one who not only saved the Egyptians from famine, but the story of one who basically consolidated all of Egypt's power from different tribal regions under the Pharaoh. I mean, that's when Egypt really became a powerful nation under Joseph. And this new Pharaoh, Joseph who? What, what are all these Israelites doing here? There's a lot of them. We need to do something about it. This is a problem. This new Pharaoh went from living alongside the Jews in harmony to instead making them their slaves. 
Do you know, none of this took God by surprise. He promised Abraham how many years before this was going to happen. In Exodus 2. Twenty-three. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. So this Pharaoh is dead. And the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. You know, when did God know about their bondage? Was it when they cried out? No, it was over 600 years before when he told Abraham, this is going to happen, but I promise you I'm going to do something about it. And now the children of Israel are crying out to God. You know, we have a God who is alive. We have a God who hears. God heard Israel. We have a God who remembers, not as if God had forgotten. Oh man, I knew I put those Israelites somewhere. That's where I left them down in Egypt. Whoa, when did that slavery take place? No, God didn't forget. But God remembered an active, intentional focusing of his attention on them. And God acknowledges, he responds to their cry, okay, now they're reaching out to me. They're calling out to me. They're ready. And in Exodus chapter 3, we see Moses as a shepherd at this time out in the fields, and he sees this bush that's on fire. It's burning, but it's not consumed. We know the story Moses goes over because this is kind of cool. He'd never seen anything like it. And he gets there, and he's told to remove his shoes because he's on holy ground. And moreover, God said to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction or the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." And so God is calling to Moses. You know, we notice here that Moses demonstrates a proper attitude towards God. Yes, as believers, we have a different relationship with God because he is our father. But at times, I think when we approach God, we may do so forgetting that he is a holy God. When Moses realizes what's going on with this burning bush, Moses hides his face. But what does God tell him? I have seen what's going on. I have heard my people's cry. I know what is occurring to them. I am going to deliver my people and bring them out. And Moses, I'm going to use you. We have a God who is active, seeing, hearing, and knowing. So Moses gets sent to Egypt in Exodus chapter 7. God tells Moses, you will speak all that I command you. Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. 
And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Moses, you're going to tell Pharaoh to release my people, to send, let my people go to leave their bondage, but I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to make sure Pharaoh says no. Now, if I were Moses, I'd probably... Well, no, we see Moses has more of a respect for God than this. But I might be thinking, God, why don't you just let Pharaoh say yes the first time? And then we just go on and we move on from life, with life. But God says, no, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Well, that doesn't seem fair, does it? I mean, after all, why would a good, loving God, a God who wants everyone to get saved, intentionally harden Pharaoh's heart so Pharaoh refuses? Well, Paul addresses this in Romans 9. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God not fair? Certainly not. You know, as we've been going through the book of Job, you know, the idea that God is completely just and sometimes what God's justice is to us and our sense of human justice doesn't seem fair. You know, we want God to judge other people, but we want God to be merciful to ourselves. No, that Ryan, he's a dirty, rotten sinner. God, you go ahead and judge him. But I know I'm a sinner too, but please be merciful to me. No, that's how we often go. But is there unrighteousness, unjustness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says of Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. God's methods are not our methods. Moses, I am going to basically destroy Egypt as I let my people go. Why? Well, go back to God's promise to Abraham. Your children will serve them, but I am going to come and visit them. I will take my vengeance. God's purpose through Pharaoh is so that there is no question who he is. We see the judgments, the ten plagues, the water being turned to blood, all of the frogs everywhere, lice, flies, death of the livestock, boils, flaming hailstones, locust, darkness, and the death of the firstborn. And all of those are for the same purpose. God is demonstrating His power. God's plan throughout the history of this wor er world, earth, worth, God's plan through the history of eternity is for him to receive the glory. And God is demonstrating his power against the Egyptians so that he receives the glory. You know, we have the same God today. We serve the God who keeps his word. God promised Abraham, I'm going to do this. Yes, it took 600 years, but God kept his word. What God has said, what God promises, he will do. The author of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 6, 18, that it is impossible for God to lie. When God is giving his promise to Abraham that I'm going to make a great nation out of you, God promises by the strongest oath that he can, by his very name, Abraham, I promise I will do this because I am God. You can take it to the bank. In Hebrews 13, 5, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. you know, God promises us that he will be with us. That includes during the difficult times of life, during our trials, during our sufferings. God is still with us. It may not seem like it. It might not feel like it. 
If you're one of those Israelites who's been oppressed for 400 years, it might feel like God is gone, that God has forgotten about you, but the promise is still there. God keeps his word, and because he does, we can trust him. The second truth, God provides deliverance. Because he does, we must obey. As we look at the deliverance that is coming, we must realize that the deliverance that God provides from judgment can only be obtained by obedience to him. The coming judgment on the Egyptians leading to the Passover. In Exodus chapter 11, Moses says, Thus says the Lord, talking to Pharaoh, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. This judgment that is coming on Egypt is coming on everyone. There are no exceptions. It doesn't matter if you are the Pharaoh, you know, the deity that the Egyptians worship, it doesn't matter if you're the poorest slave just out trying to get enough grain in your little hand mill. It doesn't matter if you're a cow. It also doesn't matter if you're an Israelite who chooses to disobey God's command. The judgment is coming on all. And we see when it's, this happens in chapter 12, verse 30, there was not a house in the land of Egypt where there was not one dead. God said it was going to happen. It happened. But he promises a deliverance from this judgment. We see this deliverance. In Exodus 12, now we get to the actual Passover story where most of us would have gone when we started. In verses 1 through 20, God gives specific instructions to Moses. Here's how you escape the coming judgment. On the tenth day of a month, you are to take a lamb. This lamb is to be without blemish. It is to be a male of the first year. It is to be in the prime of its strength. This lamb is to be kept until the fourteenth day of the month. Then kill it. The blood of that lamb must then be applied to the doorpost of your house. And if any one of the Israelites would have heard what Moses' command from God was, and they would have said, okay, you know, I, I like me a good gyro. I'll go ahead and have some lamb. But I don't want to paint my doorpost with its blood. That's, that'll clash with my curtains. You know, forget about that. What would have happened? they would not have been spared from the judgment. If they would have decided to take a lamb that had blemish, if they would have decided to take a lamb that had a broken bone, you know, I, I'll just give this old sick lamb to God instead of a young, strong one, and not obeyed God's command, what would have happened? They would have fallen under the same judgment. In verses 12 and 13, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood, this shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague will not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Obedience to God equals deliverance from judgment. And in verses 21 through 24, Moses passes on the instructions to the Israelites. It had to be done God's way. You know, when we celebrate the Lord's coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, 
You have the crowds thinking that they are selecting the king. But read through the Passion Week in your scriptures. When Christ came in was the tenth day of the month. They were selecting him. For the next four days, Christ goes through the most intense examinations of his three-year ministry. Is he going to hold up to those examinations? And then on the 14th day of the month, he's killed. You know, God is so specific with his detailed instructions for what needs to have happen. And his son followed the exact same thing. There is a future coming judgment for all men. This coming judgment we read about in Revelation chapter 20. John writes, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the books, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone found not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. With this future coming judgment that parallels this judgment on Egypt, we see all will be there. All will be judged without partiality. In Matthew 24, Christ tells us that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But there's a deliverance from this judgment as well. Hebrews 9.22, according to the law, almost all things are purified without blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness, there is no pardon. And that's what Christ did when he died on the cross. He shed his blood to give us that pardon. In Titus 3, verse 5, Paul tells us, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The future deliverance that we can have from that judgment can only be done God's way. Not through anything that we can do or attempt to do. In Revelation 5, oh man, I cannot wait to be here on this day. Chapter 5, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scrolls to open its seals. Why? For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then John looks and he hears the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures, the elders, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. There's a bunch. John's like, I'm just going to do all the biggest multiplication I can do and just there's a lot. You know, my daughter likes to see how high I can count. You know, what's the biggest number, Daddy? Well, you pick one, and I'll just add one to it. You know, infinity. Th there, there's a lot. And in unison, they're crying out, worshiping God, worshiping the lamb slain, saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Why? Because he was slain to redeem us, to save us from this future judgment. As we've seen in Peter, knowing we were not redeemed with corruptible things, but we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish, without spot. In John 19, we see when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. So instead of breaking his legs like they did to the thieves on either side of him, his legs were already, or his, he was dead. They didn't break his legs. And John writes, and he who has seen, I was there, I watched it happen. I'm testifying and my testimony is true. And I know that I'm telling the truth so that you can believe. What's he saying? He's saying, I was there. I was, I'm an eyewitness. Don't argue with me. I know what I saw. 
He says, these things were done that the Scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. You know, the lamb that was chosen for the Passover could not have a broken bone. I'm curious how many of us have been able to make it through our lives without breaking a bone. It's fairly common. I've broken a nose, but it wasn't mine. I I guess I'm lucky I haven't broken one yet, but most people end up breaking something. I guess I still have some time. In Romans 10, here's how we get this deliverance, how we follow God's plan. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, if we believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is over all, is rich to all who call upon him. For, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, we read verse 9 and we put our modern idea of confessing in for that word confess. If we confess that he is Lord, okay, if we just say it. If I pray a prayer and I am sincere in, while I'm praying, Jesus, your Lord, that's, what it, that's not what is being talked about. The Romans who would have received this letter in that early church, they would have known about something that would happen on a regular basis that we don't get today. Let's just imagine if we can that you're on a task force, you know, you're out working, you know, whatever you're building in Rome, you're building it and you're doing a great job. And all of a sudden you hear the beating of drums and a procession starts to come by and there's this little altar with incense on it. And the guards stop where you are with your work crew and they begin calling on people, you need to come and confess Caesar is Lord. You need to acknowledge that the emperor of Rome is a deity. You know, for all of your coworkers who are unsaved, they have no problem dipping their finger in the incense and saying, Caesar is Lord. No big deal. They're making that confession. But when it comes to you as a Christian... You could not confess that Caesar was Lord. You would have to confess Jesus is God. So the confessing with your mouth is more than just acknowledging, okay, Jesus, you are God. It is a total denial of yourself. It is, God, I'm about to die, but you are God, and I'm not going to confess Caesar. To confess Jesus as Lord was a death sentence. God provides deliverance, but it has to be done His way. We must obey. The third truth, God abhors sin. Therefore, as His people, we should strive to live holy lives. Going back to Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. Seven days, Moses commands, you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you will remove the leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. On the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them. But that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month on the fourteenth day of the month at evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is a stranger or a native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. 
what's the big deal with a little bit of yeast? I prefer my pastries to have yeast in them. You know, it's not a cupcake if it's flat. It's not technically bread if it's a tortilla. There's a difference. The yeast makes it taste better. But God commands the removal of leaven for a period of seven days. Why? Leaven in the scriptures is a picture of sin. A picture of how quickly and easily it spreads and it grows and it affects others. You know, if you do any baking, that recipe that calls for yeast doesn't call for a whole lot. You know, over the years I've stolen my brother's wife's pizza dough recipe. That's fine. Secret to the ingredient, you add a little bit of honey to the warm water with the yeast and it causes the yeast to react better. But all you take is a little bit of yeast. And then you have the dough when it's made and you let it sit there and after about an hour, that little ball of dough is going to be three or four times the size it started with. And that's what sin does. You know, when it starts off, we may think it's something small, something we can contain. But that sin will easily grow and spread until it's uncontainable. The Israelites were commanded by God to remove it. Moses tells them, remove the leaven from your houses. Observe the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread for seven days. No leaven in your houses. Eat nothing leavened. Eat unleavened bread. And there are severe consequences for disobedience. The person who doesn't follow this command, the person who keeps the leaven, God says will be cut off from Israel. The same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. To you and me, that may not seem like a big deal, but this is what God's saying. That person who does not remove the leaven will be removed from the place of my blessing. It doesn't matter if they are a Jew or a stranger in the land. And God commands us believers today to remove the leaven from our lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul has just chastened the church at Corinth because there was a man living in gross immorality and the church was cheering him on instead of getting rid of the sin. And Paul says, your glorying is not good. What are you thinking? Don't you know that a little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump? Therefore, get rid of it. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. Why? Because Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Which feast? The feast of unleavened bread. Not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We are commanded to remove that unspiritual leaven, the sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul writes, As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, he commands us, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, which ones? The fact that there's a new relationship. That I am no longer the enemy of God, but instead I am a child of God because God is now my God. We are commanded to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God because of that relationship we have. Leviticus 11:44 God writes I am the Lord your God you shall consecrate yourselves and be holy why because I am holy neither will you de- should you defile yourself with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God you shall therefore be holy for I am holy this holiness of God would be his crowning attribute 
Because he is set apart from sin, he desires and demands his people to be as well. As we've seen in Peter, as obedient children, not conforming ourselves to the former lust, as in our ignorance, but instead as the one who has called us is holy. We are to be holy in all of our conduct because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. God abhors sin, and as a result of that, His people, we should strive to live holy lives. 17th century Puritan Stephen Carnock wrote, It is less injury to him to deny his being than to deny the purity of it. One makes him no God, the other a deformed, unlovely, and a detestable God. He that saith God is not holy speaks much worse than he that saith there is no God at all. No, we might not say God's not a holy God, but as his representatives on this earth, as believers, do our lives show that he's an unholy God? If we are to live as he is, as he has called us to holiness, do we live that way? He is perfectly holy. Both in Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4, we see those around the throne crying, holy, 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 completely separate from sin and evil. In James 4, James, I think, sums it up very succinctly. Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Who is James writing to? Believers. Followers of God. But followers of God who would rather be like the world. Who would rather have what the world has to offer. Who would rather live for themselves and the glory of themselves. And James does not spare the language here. You adulterers and adulteresses. Now, if we think about it, what right does the bride of Christ have to be sleeping around with the world? That's the picture. We are the bride of Christ. But if we want to make our bed with the world, James is saying, we're taking ourselves and we are making ourselves God's enemy again. We are to live holy lives. Our lives are to reflect Christ, and when they don't, we make ourselves the enemy of God. What are these three simple truths? First, God keeps his word. As he promised to Abraham 600 years before the exodus would happen, He keeps his word. Are we truly trusting him? Even through the difficult and trying times, do we still trust him? Sometimes I think it may be more difficult to trust him when things are going well, though. You know, when things are going good, that's when we have the thoughts that we don't need him because things are good. God provides deliverance, but only on his terms. Have we truly obeyed his instructions? God abhors sin. Do we? Are we seeking to be holy as he is holy? Father, we thank you for your words, your truth. This feast that you established millennia ago, And yet its purpose was to point to one singular event, the death of your son on the cross. Father, I ask that you would help each of us. Lord, if there is one in here today who is struggling to trust you, to take you at your word, what you have said, I ask that you would work in their heart, in their lives, Lord, that 
they would be able to recognize that even from the Passover, things that you promised centuries before happened because you are a God who keeps his word. Lord, if there is one here who has not placed their faith and trust in you to escape this future judgment, we ask that you would work in their heart and life that today would be the day of salvation for them, that they would truly accept you as their Savior. And Lord, for those of us who are saved who may not always live for you the way that we should, I ask that you would give us the strength that we need each day to live in obedience, in holiness to you, to deny ourselves, and even to take up our cross and to follow you. Recognizing that you, as a holy God, abhor sin. We ask that you work in our midst today in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.